Doctor, I don't know if you. Yeah, let's. Uh, I've started recording. Yeah. Um, yeah, let me. Uh, there's. We have two people uh, that are attendees: Kate Schlott and Quantel Bazemore. Um, one is a former trustee, and one is a member of the EAC. But they are attendees. Now we have no other attendees that are so, supposed to be panelists. So I think you should be ready to go. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Good. All right, um, Jamie, if you can. Jamie or Maddie, can you um, allow me to share my screen? Oh yeah, I will let you. Or, or Jaime. Yeah. Go ahead. Great. Um. Jaime, or do you want to, or does someone want to just introduce this, or do you want us to? Uh, uh, I think up to this point, yeah, I think up at this point, uh, usually Simon does the intro, yeah. so I, I think that's yeah. fine with me. All right. Or, or, well, Frank, you're going you're gonna to kick it off. Yeah. yeah, okay, good, good. All right, good, all right, well, we'll start. Um, we're hoping tonight's agenda um, will be somewhat from seven to nine or um, in that time period. And um, again, I'm Frank Fish, and I will introduce the rest of the team as, as we go on here. Um, so uh, the comprehensive plan steering committee members, I think you all know, um, So, we, but we have everyone up here enlisted. I just wanna mention that eventually this does go to the Village Board of Trustees, so we're happy to have two uh, trustee members on and also to go to the Planning Board for recommendation. So we have a, the Planning Board is also represented here. Um, we are working as a firm um, with uh, King Village staff, all of whom are listed, but uh, particularly we've been day to day with the Village Planner, with Jaime Martinez. Um, and then uh, our, our own team, and you'll be hearing from some of us tonight, myself, Frank Fish, Simon Cates is uh, the project manager on this. Um, Jonathan Martin has been dealing, I think, with, as some of you know, with um, zoning issues. Sylvia Del Fava is the project planner, and, uh, and Christine is also on for planning and design. We have a, um, a uh, sub-consultant in urbanomics who's, who's looking into the school system in uh, some, some depth. And then um, an engineer, Joe Cimelli, who I think most of you know is Colored Sessions. So Simon, we can go ahead to the next. Um, I'm just gonna highlight the project schedule. I know that the committee's seen this uh, now, uh, but I think it's worth uh, just, just uh, highlighting this again. And uh, as you know, we're trying in the, uh, the blue at the top is to sort of go through, uh, get these chapters done month by month, meeting with the committee, and then um, leading to committee um, sort of public uh, hearing, which the committees are required to have during the, uh, during the process of developing the plan is what the state law says. So hopefully that'll be in October or November uh, in terms of the comprehensive plan. The plan then goes to the uh, trustees. Uh, the trustees are, um, also going to be working on zoning, taking the committee's recommendations on it. Um, they will then take the plan and the zoning and um, make any revisions. They, that would go to public hearing. We hope in the winter, you can see that in February. And then um, we have to do all in yellow on the screen. Uh, we have to do an environmental impact statement and the draft statement would also be subject to that uh, public hearing. So three things probably at the public hearing. But working up to the hearing, you see all the um, sort of tan lines and, and also quite frankly up on top the orange. Um, we, we've got both, in, we've got trying to do both um, online interactive um, uh, sort of outreach and then uh, have a public survey, which we'll talk about a little bit, and a series of subcommittee meetings. We've now completed, I think, three of those. Uh, so online outreach we see is going throughout um, the whole planning process, and we hope eventually, obviously, for the public hearing, if that could be done in person, it would be it would be helpful. Um, 
after the hearing and into the spring, we'll then revise the plan, uh, the zoning, and the EIS. And once they're finalized, the trustees will be in a position to adopt the plan in the spring. So that's the schedule. Anyway, that's the... Uh, so with that, I just want to briefly, we're making our way through, as the committee knows, um, various uh, chapters of the plan. And uh, the uh, village and regional overview is up online now. Um, I know the committee has been reviewing uh, land use and zoning. As soon as we're set on that, uh, that will go online. And then tonight, uh, tonight we hope to uh, highlight, um, among other things, highlight uh, sort of the waterfront, some of the ideas and issues. We don't have it written yet. It's just to go over ideas and issues with you on the waterfront. I did want to mention here that um, these things are somewhat, there's a somewhat interconnection between some of these things. Um, the zoning, uh, what it allows, uh, that will have impacts, for instance, on downtown and the downtown chapter. As you know, we're making some recommendations on zoning for instance, to allow housing uh, in the downtown, um, not as a conditional use or a special permit use, but as a, as a permitted principal use. So that, that may have, there's things like that that could have significant, uh, I think, impacts for the better, we hope, in downtown. And also the housing chapter itself will get into uh, various housing, uh, housing issues and uh, something we talked about today on community facilities with a sub, uh, subcommittee uh, is the school district and um, impacts on the school district. So we'll be developing those uh, in the various chapters as we go along. And I think you'll, you'll see that these things are somewhat interconnected on tax base and on um, uh, revenues to the district. So uh, at any rate, tonight we'll be uh, talking about the waterfront. So, um, Simon, you can go to this. And um, we have been asked to do a couple of other things. Uh, at our last meeting with the trustees, the mayor suggested there ought to be a uh, form-based code tutorial a little bit. And I think, well, although we say for the board of trustees, this includes anybody on the committee, uh, I'm sure. Um, we have not set that yet. We've got to set that up through the village manager. Um, and then we want to do a further uh, meeting with, um, with Jaime, with Corp Council, with Building Inspector. Um, we have not discussed in the zoning yet um, the idea of process and of uh, trying to make it a slightly more uh, streamlined process if possible. We haven't gotten there yet, so we want to do that as a stakeholder a meeting, and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be trying to do that in the next week or two. Um, and we're hoping tonight, if you have additional comments or questions on the draft uh, zoning and land use uh, chapter, we're, we're really asking if we could get any of those, you know, as you can see there by uh, June 26th. We'd like to, as possible, get the chapter up online so people, uh, people can see it. Um, so we'd like to get that up there, uh, hopefully at the end of the month or July 3rd by the latest. Yeah, just um, I, I Along those lines, uh, the committee members, um, hopefully you, you all received on Friday, we sent around the draft of, of the land use and zoning chapter. Um, and, as, and as Frank said, we wanted to, we wanna set some deadlines for ourselves internally just so that we can get, um, get chapters online for the public to see, um, but give you all a couple of weeks to, um, to send us comments. We're also happy to discuss it uh, tonight if anyone's had a chance to look through the chapter over the weekend. Um, but if not, feel free to uh, to send comments, um, I think through through Jaime. Does that does that work? Um, if everyone just just sort of sends comments through Jaime, and he'll pass it to us. I could definitely do that. Uh, good evening. I haven't uh, checked in yet. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn, by the way. Just to continue that conversation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> three years ago. So, uh, my question with respect. Uh, uh, getting feedback from the public is that both with the uh, chapter that is up and we're kind of looking for public feedback and public comments and on things like the ideas board and things like that, I don't feel like I have a clear enough directive uh, for um, 
when to focus my efforts to say, um, hey folks, during uh, this week, it's a great time for you to take X action. Uh, I think that one of the um, challenges with um, having a project that is as long as this is that uh, I, it is maintaining momentum and energy. And so uh, if there were specific times to say like um, during this uh, the one week period, we're going to make a big PR push. The village will push out information and, and all, all the trustees will and all the, everybody that has platforms will push out information uh, to all their various constituencies to say, we would love your feedback on the latest chapter, on the ideas board, on whatever. And then I think we could get a, a more concentrated efforts because if not, then it's just people that are most plugged in or uh, an unrepresentative sample of people. Uh, your thoughts? Um, if I could maybe uh, add a little bit to that. So um, I, on a call with Jamie Hoffman earlier today, we talked a little bit about positioning of, you know, some of the um, posts around us. So every Tuesday uh, on a steering committee meeting, they have a post reminding people to come and visit uh, the steering committee meeting. Every Thursday following that, they have sort of a follow-up post. We do a follow-up post on the village website to do that. And then every other Tuesday when we're not doing this, um, there's going to be a post talking about the ideas wall. And so we've seen some, we've seen a lot more engagement uh, when the ideas wall was posted through the mayor's e-blast than we have through Facebook. So we're going to put a little bit of um, an ad boost. Like I think we're talking about maybe $10 into each one of these posts to try to get more action on the ideas wall. But right now is the time to really focus in on the ideas wall. After the ideas wall comes in is, is the next sort of online interactive step. Um, I don't know, Simon, if you had planned on talking about that today or not, but maybe it's a good point to. Yeah, um, so um, Omar, Omar, it's a great, it's a great comment, and it's something that we have been thinking about, and we can continue to sort of evolve what our what our approach is. And just a couple of things that that um, you bring to mind. Number one is that we're going to talk a little bit later about the public survey, which is sort of our next um, online uh, tool. We typically also do surveys in hard copy, and and we can think you know, with, with, um, with all of you and with Karen and Jaime about how to, how to do that. I think we're still going to need to do that. Um, um, but we may need a little more of a sort of, um, you, you know, a different kind of strategy to get, get hard copies out. Um, and then the next one is the interactive map. But um, uh, one thing that maybe we can do uh, in each of these tools, so right now will be the idea as well, is, is to make it easy for you guys to send you the URL the, the, the web link with a little bit of text. Um, and even, even as the village is posting Facebook and, and sending out eblasts, um, if that makes it easier for all of you to send the link out to your social media networks, to your email list, however you, you can do that, um, if, we can, if we give you a little bit of copy, is that, is that something that can help you guys out? Or, or is there another way that we can, we can you know, provide information to you to make it easier for you? Yeah, I, I think what would be uh, best for me is, I think it's a couple things. One is uh, um, quantitative goals. So something like we want to get 5,000 comments on the ideas wall. We want to get 300 comments. I don't know like what the right metric would be, but we want to get 300 ideas on the ideas wall. Right now we're at 27. And so over the course of the next four weeks, we're going to really push to get those 300 ideas. Will yours be one of those 300 ideas? Something like that, right? Um, two, uh, as a subset of that, um, it could be, we're getting a lot of ideas about the waterfront and nobody's saying anything about Main Street. We're getting a ton of ideas about business development or um, uh, uh, how to get more business in the downtown, but nobody's saying anything about the environment. Do you have any ideas about the environment? Whatever. So what are subsections of the ideas wall that could activate certain parts of the uh, community? Um, and num either number two or uh, one C or however it is that we're counting this, um, I think that having um, concerted, I think a copy could be helpful, but uh, not just copy like fill out the ideas wall, but uh, again, copy that is uh, targeted toward uh, uh, either audiences or goals. And I, I've just seen that with the census, for example, having um, uh, a metric that we're building towards with the census is like completion rates. With this, it could be a, a certain goal that we're pushing toward, um, but also knowing 
who it is that's completing the census, or in this case, who it is that's submitting ideas. Maybe not who submitted ideas, but what those ideas are about. Like, all of those things uh, could be helpful. And then if you have the capacity to send copy, like that is always welcome. Uh, but I, I just think that the, um, the pull could be stronger than the push. And Omar, just so you know, in terms of the upcoming survey, which we'll, we'll talk about, um, that one does, we do have both, uh, we do have a quantitative goal there. I mean, we need to get at least 5% response. You'd like to get 10% in the survey, but you need 5% to make it, you know, really um, meaningful. So there'll be some quantitative goals there, but also we want to set a real deadline. We find that people, something that goes on, as you said, you know, and stretches out, uh, people tend to lose track of. So, and we, so we need to set a, a timeline there. So your, your comments are well taken. We'll, we'll give that, you know, some thought on yeah. products and details. The other one I've just mentioned, it, it's easy to forget. It, and, and I'd actually like your advice and, and see what you all think. You know, as chapters go up, well, now they're up and you will add to chapter two and it'll become chapter two and three and then two, three and four. It would be nice to remind the, remind the public as those go up, if that's a time to make some comments on them before they, you know, before it gets lost in memory. So maybe we can stress that too with um, some notices. Well, all right. Maybe we, uh, so yeah, just um, uh, on on the land use and zoning chapter, um, just circle back. Uh, just send us comments by the twenty sixth. We'll take comments from you guys after that, but it's just to give us a deadline so that we can make edits and then get a get a, a version online for public to see. Yeah. Right. So we're going to turn this to Sylvia uh, to uh, sort of talk about the work a little bit. Thank you, Frank. Um, so as uh, Frank just mentioned, we're going to go over the waterfront and with some preliminary ideas. And I will talk about a little bit about the existing conditions and also what the 2009 plan was suggesting uh, as strategies and objectives to see if they're still relevant for you all um, or, you know, if there are any changes that we we can make and, uh, you know, new suggestions. So. Yeah. Before we move forward, I apologize, Sylvia. I'm, I'm so sorry no, to cut you off. Uh, we do have a new uh, planning, uh, a new um, steering committee member here today. Um, so I think we should uh, introduce him. His name is Pat Yost. Um, give him an opportunity Hi. to say hello to the whole crowd. I do apologize. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Oh yeah, we, we are familiar with him. We just uh, met him in a subcommittee meeting. So, so, I, I just want to take a, a few seconds. Can we just go back to the, the full screen and just introduce Pat to everybody and, and just go through that pretty quickly? So I just feel like that's, I want to make sure he's, he's we're getting him up to speed and he's part of the group. Right. Uh, stop sharing your screen for just a moment. Um, oh, sorry. You don't, have, sorry. you don't have to go back. Just stop uh, screen sharing. Yeah. Yep, there's everybody. All right. Hi, Pat. So um, why don't um, we give a, a quick uh, round, um, starting with Frank. Just uh, introduce yourself. Which Frank? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Frank Budding. Two Franks. Frank. <laughs> okay. But, and uh, we have, if you guys could just unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves and, and uh, just go through the committee members and then the, um, our friends at BFJ real quick. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you very much, folks. All right. So, um, anyway. here you want me to? I'll call everybody's yeah, name good. out to, from I, my screen. I, I that way, really to, hate you this don't. Part of All right. So, Simon, uh, Simon, um, and, yes, Simon, Frank, Fish, you have already, uh, I guess, in as well. And I've, and I've been I've been on a, I've been on a couple of the previous calls as well. So oh, okay, uh, so you've met the BFJ folks. So, yeah, so um, I've, I've met the BFJ folks. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank all you. right. Frank Budding. Uh, Frank Budding. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, Frank, you are muted. No, it's, no, you should be able to hear me. Yeah. Um, uh, right. I'm uh, I'm a resident in. Broadway here in Austin. Um, 
I am an agricultural consultant and I have my advice to be actively involved in the green planning aspect of city planning. Um, and that's sort of how I got onto this committee as well. Yeah. Uh, Maddie, did you want to introduce yourself real fast? Sure. Um, I'm Maddie Zahach. I am a lifelong uh, resident of the village of Assening, and I joined uh, the village team in January of this year as assistant village manager. Jamie Kane, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jamie Kane. I work in the planning department with Jaime for, uh, well, I've been there for the last four years, and uh, I first comp plan, so. Uh, Trustee Quesada, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thanks, Jaime. Um, I know Quesada, Bill, I've been a village trustee since 2012, took a break in 2018, and I've been in Austin for the past 20 plus years now. So. Uh, Melissa Banta, would you introduce yourself? I'm Melissa Banta. I am a lifelong resident of the village of Austining. Uh, I currently sit on the school board as well. John Jonathan Martin, can you introduce yourself? I know you're uh, part of the team, but you haven't had a chance. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, I'm Jonathan Martin. I'm with BFJ Planning. I've been there for uh, about almost 10 years uh, with a focus on urban design, zoning, land use. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Gasparro. Uh, hi, Jeff Gasparro. I'm a member of the Village Planning Board. Uh, I'm an attorney and I live here with my wife and two young sons. Uh, Rebecca. Hi, Pat. Uh, I'm Rebecca, or most people call me Becky. Um, I've been a resident of Austin for the past nine years, but I also graduated from Austin. Um, this is my first time sitting on a committee in the village. And we also have uh, Sheila Vereen Massengale. Hi, I'm Sheila Vereen Massengale. I'm a Community Voices Hurt member and a resident of Austin. And then uh, we also have Stuart Gahan as Corp Council. I'm Mr. Yost. I'm Yes, sir. He said the Corporation Council. <laughs> and my name is Jaime. I'm the planning director, Jaime Martinez. I've only been uh, working with the village for about three months, so I'm yeah. probably the newest one here. Okay. And, and I guess I can introduce myself a little bit. So I'm, uh, so I'm, I'm Pat Yost. I'm a resident of the village, clearly. Um, I've lived here for 18 years now, I think, about. Um, as far as the, the very first conversation goes, I uh, am not, I'm not originally from the New York area. I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. So um, I've lived in the metro New York area for about 20 years now, though. So um, either in the city or, or up here. So it's uh, we definitely, definitely migrated to the East Coast. Um, you know, I'm really excited to be, to participate. And thanks for the opportunity. Um, I've been, I was, uh, involved in the last comprehensive planning uh, project and participated in a couple of the workshops there as well and um, I currently I currently am on the recreational advisory board um, uh, for the for the town village in, in, in Briarcliff that's kind of a, an intermunicipality committee um, and I also am on the, the board of directors at Austin Children's Center and so that's a you know, the cause that's near and dear to my heart, um, the early childhood. So, uh, look here in Austin with a wife, two kids. And, um, looking forward to it. Thanks. Jaime did, Jaime didn't introduce me because he wanted to say the, the best for last. No disrespect, Jaime. It's all good. It's all <laughs> oh good. my goodness, I'm so no, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> and no, it's all good. It's the headliner. Don't worry about it. Omar Lopez, I'm a village trustee here. Um, there's a lot of people from the old school. I'm representing the new school. I've been a trustee since January. Um, pandemic uh, trustee and uh, excited to be serving on this committee with you, Pat. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, Pat. And um, now we can resume our, our previous uh, scheduled programming. 
<laughs> Very good. Okay, go for it, Sylvia. All right. Okay. Um, so again, uh, we're going to talk about the waterfront and this um, a little bit about the existing conditions today. Um, there's a there are a lot of different uses on the waterfront, and I. I pulled them up with a few of the assets as well, but as you can see, there is some um, recreational uses, uh, Crab Hockey Park, and you know, down more to the center waterfront. Um, Angle Park, I guess, is the uh, biggest, and uh, uh, some water dependent uses, uh, recreational still, uh, Yacht Club, and the Westerly Marina. But then we can't ignore the fact that Sing Sing uh, Prison takes up a large portion of the waterfront as well. Uh, and just north of it, uh, we have the Austin West was wastewater treatment plant um, and other, you know, water dependent use, uh, if you will. Um, a couple other features, um, a recent development, pretty big development on the waterfront. Um, it's uh, right by number seven uh, on the map. Uh, it's the Arbor Square. I'm sure everyone is familiar with it. So mostly residential, 10% of affordable housing, uh, and a restaurant on the, um, at the ground floor. And it's um, worth mentioning that as part of the development, um, a park uh, was built, uh, as well as the part of the uh, Riverwalk Trail. Um, other few features, it's uh, Metro North Station is right there uh, by the waterfront. and. Uh, the DPW site, uh, it's a village owned, uh, pretty big uh, parcel that we're gonna talk about a little bit. So uh, we're not gonna get deep into the zoning uh, tonight, <laughs> since we already had like, plenty uh, last month. But uh, I just wanna point it out that after the 2009 plan, um, a big portion of the waterfront was, uh, um, adopted new zoning districts. Um, and a few of the new zoning districts are the conservation development up north, uh, the planned waterfront at three different sub-districts, A, B, and C, um, and the two station plaza um, districts that are just, they're like very small districts around the stations, one being Austin Station and the other one uh, Scarborough to the south. And uh, the other new district is the riverfront development more uh, to the like central uh, area uh, right on the edge. And those are uh, highlighted in blue just uh, for your reference. But some of the goals uh, that the 2009 uh, comprehensive plan had in mind were, uh, you know, promoting mixed use development, um, have more public, public uh, space accessible um, along the waterfront. And part of it would be the continuation of the river walk, uh, which we will talk about it a little later, but it's like a trail um, that kind of follows the Hudson River. And then a couple other objectives were the protection of the view corridors and the historic buildings, and uh, possibly connections to the waterfront over the railroad tracks that are, you know, very expensive proposition, but um, I guess, you know, a long term uh, strategy. Next one. Talking about issues, uh, I'm sure everyone is familiar with uh, one of the major issues. Sorry, Sylvia. Yeah. Sorry yeah. So on, uh, on the maps that you were showing before in regards to the waterfront of existing conditions, and I guess this question could be um, to Jaime as well, or to whoever feel free to answer. We do have uh, an approved project, um, which is Hidden Cove. Are we not making this part of this map? I know it's, I know you call it existing conditions, but because it's approved. Um, it's, uh, Manny, it's in the PWA zone. Okay. I think it's, the, I think it's marked on the map there. At least the zone is. Probably it is, but you when you call when when you mentioned Harvard Square, you didn't mention the other project. Again, it could be just because it's not it's not there right now, but it's an approved project. Annie, it's no, a good point very, though. Yeah. 
Yeah, That's as we write for. it up, we'll, we'll certainly list it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah and uh, totally. Yeah, I want to reiterate that this is an open discussion. So feel free to jump in at any time. And, you know, we still have to write the chapter. So any input is really helpful. So uh, thank you um, to, to Manny. Um, yeah, you Manny, can... we have some data on Hidden Cove, if I remember, also from the school district. So. Okay. So um, another, I guess, not existing conditions, but uh, future condition uh, will be the um, issue with the sea, sea level rise. And in general, the waterfront area, most of the waterfront area is in the floodplain zone. Um, I pulled a couple of maps uh, that show the medium projection for sea level rise. We obviously don't know um, which scenario will um, will be true. Uh, so for now, we, we just pulled the, like, the middle one. And, uh, and still, in, you know, in, two, in the 2050s, there's not too much of an impact. But definitely in the 2080s, uh, we start to see some areas, uh, especially the, uh, the where you can see like a red uh, outline, uh, where there is definitely some impact. There's going to be some impact. Um, and those are, for example, the Westerly Marina and the, um, the Yacht Club over there and uh, down south by Sing Sing. Um, so, um, just, I guess, so, Sylvia, yeah, just one thing to add here is um, one thing that we've talked about uh, with, um, with Karen and Jaime is, is um, and, and the mayor mentioned it last week uh, when, when we, were, we were briefing the trustees at the work session, is the, the Cornell Adaptive Design Studio. We are, we're very interested in seeing the product of that so that we understand the analysis that they did. Um, the, the data here and these maps are, are on, a, on a website that Scenic Hudson puts out. Um, the data is from New York State DEC. As Sylvia mentioned, uh, you, you know, it, the, these are projections. So we don't, we don't really know, you know, when these different uh, cases of sea level rise are going to come to pass. Um, but um, you know, it, it'll it'll be good for us to to, to see that um, that that uh, that academic work and, and and you know better understand how we can incorporate that into the comprehensive plan as well. And this is Sylvia and, and Simon. I think you know I, I, I took a look at all. At, I went down to the presentation for the adaptive climate stuff in Cornell. I think the the part that's really impactful for me. Uh, and I would suggest potentially adding to this is not just the current 100 year floodplain, but what's the floodplain, what's the 100 year floodplain look like in that 2050 medium projection scenario? I think you'll find that the, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable how far inland the, um, the projected 100 year floodplain goes and, and relative to development on the other side of the train tracks, that's gonna be very absolutely um, relevant. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Uh, well, we can show we can show that we can re, you know we can respond to that uh, because actually when you look at these maps, um, uh, you know, first impression that uh, I had was that I had expected you know somewhat more of an impact. These were, you know, particularly the 2050 has what looks like a more modest uh, impact. Um, so we'll look at those floodplain data a little bit and the Cornell material. Yeah, because I think, I think the, the, just the base sea rise projections, that's, you know, the, the sea level rise, that, that's mean, I think that's mean, mean, high, mean tide, right? So right. You know, the reality is that you know, we have in Austin tides that are plus or minus, plus or minus two to three feet, right? two, you know, plus or minus two feet right now. Right, so mm -hmm. between high tide and a low tide cycle, you'll get up to four feet of difference in the water, um, just you know in a normal day, let alone high tide or a storm situation. So, so I mean, I, I wanted to just uh, clarify um, if you could for me, uh, just looking at the maps and where the projected you know sea level rise takes it. Mm -hmm. Most of the affected areas are currently. Um, 
dry docks for boats or Sing Sing, correct? It, it doesn't appear that any of the new development is affected by this so far, right? Well, I would say I would say to Pat's point, um, Jaime, that that it, it's correct, except that I would say that the areas that are inundated are um, are are the the marinas and Sing Sing, but the areas that are impacted um, might might be areas that would have a, a more severe um, more severe floodplain uh, issue. Well, we'll need to document. Yeah, I think it's a good question on the floodplain. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, for me, the situation is, you know, consider, you know, even just a category one hurricane that didn't hit us directly uh, in Sandy, you know, the high, the storm surge on that down at the waterfront was eight feet. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm trying to, I guess what I'm trying to do is hone in on the, um, the question to make sure that we understand it correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. You're, you, by raising this map, of course, we are raising a, a few issue for the committee and the trustees. Um, we don't know the resolution right now, but um, we've seen what some other communities on the Hudson have been doing. Uh, one was uh, discussed with Jaime earlier was uh, Beacon. Um, so uh, eventually you have to make some uh, decisions as to the approach uh, to the area, but you need the best data we can get to do that. But, um, you know, in some cases where we've been working, the, um, because of this particular circumstances, uh, you couldn't just retreat from the waterfront. In other cases, you could. In, in Binkin, they've made a conscious decision to not have development uh, between the Hudson, the current banks of the Hudson, and the Metro North tracks. Um, obviously, not going to make that type of decision here when you're involving Sing Sing Prison. <laughs> but, but um, you know, you've got to look at the issue and how you approach it and how development is approached. Um, you know, are you treating back from certain areas? Are you building in berms or fortifying? Or are you doing a building code to control building issues uh, so that you can accommodate flooding. So there's gonna be a, a set of issues eventually that you may wanna put in the plan. Yeah, and we're gonna talk a little bit more um, yeah. at the end of the presentation about it. So um, yeah, you can move on, Simon, thanks. So here's just an overview of the shoreline, kind of like seen as from the Hudson looking east. Um, so we, we asked our que this question, oh, what's the accessible shoreline? Um, you know, there, is, uh, there are the rail tracks uh, are right by the waterfront in most areas. And then we have the um, wastewater treatment plant and Sing Sing there and again, for now, they're just gonna stay. So they're not accessible, they're not um, for the public, that there's no access. Uh, one thing to mention maybe is that Sparta Dock was used to be accessible. Um, and this is a small, uh, you know, parkland that is uh, sticking out into the Azzo River and uh, used to be accessible because it was used to be, uh, you know, allowed to, tr to uh, across the railroad tracks at grade, and now for safety reason, obviously there's uh, there's no access anymore. If uh, I'm mistaken, wasn't there an underpass? Didn't it go under the tracks? I, mean, I don't know if someone else on the call knows that. Um, Sylvia, so I, was I, I think that, I think an overpass right. was proposed in the 2009 plan. No, there, yeah. there, was, there was an overpass and there still is the remainders of an overpass in there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, um, well, yeah, there's no such a thing right now to, to cross over. Um, so it's, you know, it's a question that like, if we want to make the investment because it's, um, it's a very, you know, um, costly uh, capital project. Um, so- while we're on that, Sylvia, yeah. I just wanted to ask Manny if he knows the history of that bridge. Was that bridge pedestrian only or was it 
for vehicles? No, it was pedestrian only. Okay. Because the, the cost differential is terrific. If it's just pedestrian only, you know, you're talking a million plus, but if, you know, if it's, um, you know, for fire engine, you know, you got to, you know, be able to accommodate a fire truck or something, then you're talking multiple of that. Right. Yeah. So the area where uh, I guess we can focus on targeted op uh, opportunities for uh, public access to the waterfront is really like uh, what we can call the central waterfront. Um, and I guess we can go to the next one that is a, a zoom in um, to the area. Um, and it brings us to the first uh, issue and opportunity area that uh, was also in the 2009 plan, maximize public access to the waterfront, but we use the word targeted opportunities because really what we can do is limited uh, because of the railroad tracks um, and other barriers. Uh, so here, uh, as you can see, there are kind of like three different areas. The one to the left, which is north, is the, where we have those private uses um, that are water dependent and uh, recreational. Uh, the Westerly Marina, there is a restaurant, the boat house, and the yacht club. Then um, the next um, big uh, parcel, it's, um, it's, it's actually two uses. One is the the oil tanks uh, towards, the, towards the shoreline. And more inland, there is a warehouse building that, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's vacant right now. And there is a road uh, right where is the um, blue, the dark blue line where uh, it's uh, the pointer is right now. Um, it's called Quimby Street. And that's uh, obviously a public road. Uh, and there is an opportunity to perhaps um, open that road to, for public access. Um, obviously, you know, there is a, a portion of that road at the, at the very end that is fenced out because it's, uh, um, I, I think it's owned by the Westerly Marina. But, you know, talking about opportunities, this uh, might be the one uh, that can open up more access to the waterfront. Then moving south, uh, you can recognize the, um, the Arbor Square uh, development and the light blue uh, line that goes along the shore, it's the existing Riverwalk Trail. And as I briefly mentioned before, it's, um, it's a county plan, uh, but the village uh, uh, took, a, um, took a study uh, on how we can, how Austin can expand the Riverwalk Trail. And this was in 2011. Uh, so they identified some options, some short-term and long-term options. Um, so for now, just the light blue uh, portion is the one existing. Uh, so the long-term is shown in orange and it's more, you know, it's right uh, at, the, at the shoreline. But one short-term option is the uh, dark blue um, trail that will go along uh, Westerly uh, Road and uh, uh, Quimby Street that I just mentioned. Um, and then it will continue, but uh, you know, uh, farther inland actually. Um, so, you know, this is like an open question. Do you see any other opportunities um, you as resident uh, and stakeholders in this uh, process, um, you know, um, anything that can jump to your eye that, um, as an opportunity that we can so talk about. We, yeah, well, we wanted to, just to piggyback on that, but we wanted to drill in, drill in on here is that the, the 09 plan recommends to um, increase the areas where you can access the waterfront. And at first glance, uh, there don't seem to be very many opportunities where, where one could do that, um, as Sylvia highlighted. So the, the question that we wanted to put to you all tonight is, are, are there actually areas that we are not seeing where public access can be provided to, in the waterfront? Um, if not, uh, well, if, if there are, we want to we wanna be specific about what they are and how that public access can be provided. If there aren't, then we want to focus on, some, on, a, on a different project, which is um, improving or enhancing, doing something with the access that you already have. Um, we want to make sure that we are we are 
accurately reflect reflecting what the opportunities are. Well, I have a question about, um, you know, on the west side, right, of Manhattan, there is that long kind of bridge that stretches from, um, I guess, the sort of the park in front of the Trump properties all the way up to uh, Dykeman. Um, and it sort of goes on the, at the outer edge of the water and creates this trail, but it's not, you know, so much a hardscape as it's sort of like a, you know, a lot of it is a, a metal sort of bridge that brings people up. It's on piers, exactly. On yeah. piers, yeah. I mean, what what is the viability of even something like that? Is that a massive expense, or is that? I mean, I we have some background in that. That's um, uh, there's two. There's at least two issues anyway that uh, New York City ran into it, and we've run into it along the Hudson, uh, actually in Yonkers. Um, one is the permitting process. You need both DEC and you need the federal government, the US Army Corps of Engineers for that. And the second issue is the cost. It's, it's fairly expensive uh, to do that. Uh, we looked at it just recently, and Jaime, you're familiar with this, between um, the plant, uh, the big Glenwood power plant in Yonkers, down to the new um, development uh, the old Point Street Landing. Uh, there's a whole area in there that could have a road connection, but it's not quite wide enough. And to get one, you'd have to get those permits, and the money angle became just prohibitively expensive. So it's it's not uh, an inexpensive proposition. New York City, most of that trail you mentioned in New York City is actually on solid land uh, where the bike lane is and or the joint use path there's there is a portion that they recently rebuilt uh, and that's where it, it is built on some piles but uh, i'm not saying it can't be done it, it can be done no but, i don't i don't know that i'm necessarily recommending it but yeah, I, I, yeah. I know that it's it's a thing that exists somewhere else and um yeah. earlier in the day in our meeting we talked about trade-offs right and so the cost yes. of doing things you know, everything has a cost, right? As the, the old engineer is saying is that, you right. know, I can build you anything as long as you give me the money, right? Yes. So no. um, having an understanding, I think, of the, the kinds of costs that would be involved in putting up something like that is important because maybe people are interested in it, maybe it helps redirect the discussion towards something that is more reasonable. Yes, okay. I think, and that, uh, you know, Jaime, to, 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 to piggyback on that a little bit, one of the adaptive, one of the Cornell study options, I think, if I recall correctly, was, was actually something like that, where you build a, you almost, you build a boardwalk that's above the rising water level and um, kind of along the whole, along the whole west side of the, the train tracks, right? Was, I mean, that was one of the, the, you know, non-cost you know they, they they looked at it just purely from a design perspective you know there wasn't really a lot of cost um you know, there wasn't a big there was some concern of cost but not the major one but there was some pretty interesting concepts just in that right? mm -hmm. um from that perspective but, and the, the only other, the only other thing i want to just add real quick is that um well, it's it's not necessarily it's it's a it's an asset, but a little bit more in terms of um, people visiting Ossining um, at Shadamuck Yacht Club. Um, the the outermost set of docks there, the outermost set of docks and fingers, those are actually um, dedicated transient facilities. Oh, okay, um, that's good. Right, and those were actually put in place. Four, three, four years ago, through a boating infrastructure grant. So, um, so that I mean, transient from, boating. Yeah. So, from an asset perspective, you know, that's yeah. something to take into consideration, right? Yeah. Is there? Do you there know if there's? In, oh, sorry. I, I, I was just going to ask: Is there anywhere in in either of those private? Uh, um, Boating facilities where the public is allowed to walk out on, on the docks. In other words, if you're not arriving from the boat, if you're coming from the village itself, are you able to enter the, 
those facilities or are they closed off to the public? So, so the restaurant is, is open to, to the public, right? So the Boathouse restaurant and, and, you know, generally people, you know, go out on that. So the restaurant is sort of the middle, in the middle of that section there, it's, you know, the, the largest kind of gray pier, like yeah, a little bit to the left there. Right there, that one. That's the restaurant. <laughs> All right, and then there are a couple of docks there, and, and from that perspective, and then um, you know, Shadow Monk gets people who every now and then who walk out on the um, walk out on the on the, the attenuator dock, which is the, the the transient facility, right? But primarily, that's you know people coming in, people come dock there, eat at the restaurant. You know, they can dock there and walk down the three westerly, you know, things like that, right? So it, it's not fully closed off necessarily. How often do you get someone who um, who arrives, uh, docks at the transient docks, goes to the restaurant, and then goes anywhere else in the village? Um, two two answers. Th I'll give you three different answers, I think, right? And, and I can get the numbers for you, um, a little bit more specific data. So I think last year they had uh, over paying transients who stayed overnight. I think they had over a hundred transient nights at those facilities. Mm -hmm. um, and then, which, which is you know, you know, people that are coming that can use use village, the use village, use the village, anything in the village, right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second answer was how many people come and kind of go to the restaurant. And you know, that happens almost nightly, quite honestly. Like people come in and they go to, three, go to the boathouse or three westerly, especially on the weekends. And they're generally going to be, you know, four or five, you know, four or five boats a night coming in. And that's without, you know, major publicizing or anything like that. Okay. So. Oh, okay. The uh, the ones who might stay overnight, where do they stay? On their boat? Do they yep. stay? Uh, okay. Yeah, they stay in the boat. Yep. Okay. Can so, I ask a question? Go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. Um, the, all this public space that we have available for the moment, that is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's say, projected on the on on the basis as we have been used to using it but how are we going to go forward if we enter a period that we have to do long-term social distancing can we accommodate that can we then expand space so that there is more walking space or sitting space that allows for that or are we presuming that everything goes back to normal, which I don't believe for a second. <laughs> anyway, it's a question to yeah, consider. Frank, it's a good question. I don't think we have a real answer. We haven't been, I think we'll probably need, or everyone may need some more data, uh, some more, you know, some many more months before we see, for instance, the vaccine, a vaccine, you know that four to six of them are being tested now, one in England. But um, if that comes and it's effective, then your need for social distancing that we're doing now may be lessened somewhat. Um, so we just, I don't think we, we can answer the question right now. Uh, it's a good question. I, 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 I don't know that we have an absolute answer except that to, to listen to the, you know, the different medical experts. We may know better by the time our plan gets to public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which we're hoping will be maybe yeah. in February of next year. <laughs> Thank you. And, and don't forget also that actually the village is also working and expanding the dock on, on that as well. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, you know, that's something that that will increase, um, or we hope 
to increase that, that activity and that so on as well. Good. Yeah, what is exactly the dock that is expanding? Is it the ferry dock that is gonna? Correct, yes. Right, okay, thanks. Yep. Great. So getting into another area, more um, targeting economic development strategies at this point. Um, so we, you know, we ask ourselves, what are the things that attract residents and visitors to the waterfront? And really what um, we will see as, as another view from, the, from an aerial view, uh, there is an area in the central waterfront that is, uh, it's missing a little bit of identity. And um, there's some that's really like a disconnection between, um, you know, uses and uh, there are many uses, but uh, perhaps um, a concept of uh, creating a more complete neighborhood uh, um, where everything is at a walkable distance um, may really help into, um, you know, creating synergies of uses and uh, creating a balance of uh, residential uses with other uses because, you know, everything residents support businesses and, uh, you know, and also maybe we need some light industry for jobs. And uh, so all these uh, opportunities can be unlocked also uh, if we look at the village owned parcels such as the, the uh, DPW site and, um, as, as you can see in the photo, there is a lot of potential there, uh, including connection to the Sing Sing um, Hill Greenway, which is, uh, you know, not that far. Um, and obviously, you know, it can trigger like in, um, more like expand more the tax base uh, in general. Um, so this next one is still tied to these um, um, objective uh, of uh, promoting development uh, and finding the balance between uh, uh, these different uses. And I want to highlight that the uh, boundary in red, uh, in the dotted red um, outline, it's, um, it's the area that uh, I was just talking about. There is so much potential um, and it's really we can call it the central waterfront, you can call it uh, however you want, but it's really missing maybe um, a vision, a cohesive vision uh, to move forward, to um, maximize the opportunities that are already there. Because, you know, we have a, a train station, we have some residential uses already, uh, we have uh, recreational uses, we have a, like, you know, um, a pretty uh, large area of uh, public public access on the waterfront, which is beautiful. Uh, so, you know, building it upon the existing assets, um, as I, I just listed the Sing Sing um, Museum Preview Center that hopefully will be open in the next few months. Uh, we can really build uh, something that is, uh, uh, it's more of a neighborhood really, uh, and it's more connected throughout, uh, you know, from one, the south part to the north part, which is another uh, issue, uh, in addition to be connected to the downtown, which we'll get into that uh, later on. And as a last point listed on the left, I, uh, I want to mention the northern uh, industrial waterfront and, uh, for example, the uh, X uh, peel factory, um, where it used to be the peel factory, the site. Uh, uh, you know, again, open to discussion. Uh, how do you see? How do you see some improvement there? What What would you see as a as an opportunity to uh, for the waterfront uh, in that area as well? Yeah, I think one just to add one one small thing. Um, it, when we were looking at the O nine plan, the two thousand nine plan, one thing that jumped out to us was that. This area that's outlined in red here, the 2009 plan um, considers it to be part of the downtown. And it feels to us to be much more part of the, the waterfront. But it's still split from Harbor Square and from Engel Park and everything that's on the actual waterfront by the train tracks. Access is an issue that we'll talk about in a couple of slides. Um, 
but but um, sort of looking at this neighborhood that exists and trying to figure mm -hmm. out what its what its vision for the future is uh, might be a way to um, um, you know to sort of build on what's there, as Sylvia said, um, 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 you know, build on its assets, but also make it more of a draw um, for for both potential residents, residents, businesses, and also visitors. All right, into the next one. Yeah, this point was um, was part of the 2009 plan, and we uh, we wanted to keep it and you know see uh, what you all are thinking about. But it, obviously, we we are in an area that it's full of environmentally sensitive uh, lands, such as steep slopes. Um, there is a there are a lot of streams that uh, get into the Azu River eventually. And so we want to protect these areas and um, highly suggest a few, but obviously the um, conservation development district, uh, some of the objectives of this district were really to, uh, you know, kind of like strike the right balance of um, protecting the environment, uh, but maybe uh, allow for some um, minor building um, if it's uh, if it ma that makes sense um, and obviously the Hudson River uh, shoreline has uh, some erosion issues that we want to um, we want to really protect the, the from you know further erosion uh, and wetlands I know that Jaime is <laughs> working right now on a wetland um, some text uh, for the zoning to, to include some wetlands uh, regulations. Um, so it's they're all areas that are particularly um, valuable also for their, their ecological services that they do for our uh, for us. And I will turn it to if you know if the, you guys don't have anything else to add to this slide. I think uh, Simon, you can. Uh, move forward with the others. Uh, um, great, so there's, there's just three more of these um, and then we'll, um, and then we're happy to, to open it up to more, uh, more discussion. But we touched on this one a little bit before um, Frank, um, um, Frank was, was um, reinforcing some of these points, but um, we, we've got to think about what, um, what the future actually is on the waterfront. And there are a lot of big open questions here that have to do with um, which areas um, may be appropriate for new development versus which ones may not be. And we want to start to think about that. Um, Frank mentioned the Beacon example where um, the city of Beacon made a decision to, um, to change what their future plans were for, for some areas on the waterfront and pull back um, from, from potential development plans. Um, are there ways to, uh, to harden the shoreline or, or or maybe using soft uh, soft shoreline measures to uh, to provide greater protections. Um, that's that's something else we want to start to think about. Um, is that something that the village can pay for? Probably not. That's that's a huge capital cost. So so I just wanted to real quickly. We have. Um, I apologize for cutting you off, Simon. We have a we, one of the attendees is raising their hand, um, and I I know that we don't normally allow for the public to engage in the process here. And I don't know if you want to make- That's fine. If somebody has a question who's an attendee, that's not a problem at all. Okay, it was uh, Quantel Bazemore. Um, that's fine. All right. Do you mind if I allow him to um, yep. ask his question? Yeah. Sure, go for it. Hi, Quantel. I think Quantel is still muted. He is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was asking questions. Uh, I must have- Hello, or did you intend on uh, raising your hand? No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So, um, as I was saying, a lot of big, a lot of big questions here um, that need to be addressed. Um, third item: Are there are there best practices that that the village needs to start considering? Um, for both old structures and new, um, you know, ways ways to adapt old structures 
um, you, you know, again, we're very interested in seeing what, um, what the folks at Cornell came up with. Um, the next one here is, um, this is not just the project for the village, right? The village is going to have to coordinate um, at, at all, all scales um, um, for solutions here on the waterfront. Um, we, we sure hope the MTA comes up with a plan for, for the Hudson Line. Um, if and when they do, um, we'd like to know how it, um, how it uh, accommodates um, the village of Austin's vision for its own waterfront and, uh, and solutions that, that allow for um, the continue, uh, sort of continued um, growth of the neighborhood uh, down there in a way that the village wants, um, public access and so on, um, while also protecting areas that, um, that are able to be protect protected. Um, but barring a solution by, by MTA, should the village start to think about what, um, what, the, what, what your own solutions are east of the train tracks, not just west of the train tracks. So um, we're, we're sort of putting these out there. These aren't things that we know the answer to yet. We want to start digging into um, some, some preliminary ideas here in the comprehensive plan. Uh, but some of these solutions are going to come, uh, you know, they're going to follow up on, uh, on the comprehensive plan and deeper study um, you know, to, to try to, to try to get, sort of get, get some resolution, resolution and try to figure out what, what we can do in order to protect uh, the assets that you've got down there. Um, hard. I just add here, Simon, I, I just add, this is a difficult issue all along the Hudson River. Um, so I think the, the village, this one is something we, and we can use guidance um, on from you all. Um, I, I would suggest the last two dot points here are, fairly critical to discuss, but I would think that, um, and I've said this internally, our experience with MTA is that you may not want to wait on MTA. Um, they have no known plans we're aware of, uh, and then from other work on the Hudson. So I think the village itself may want to take a little bit of lead in this plan, and then maybe even meet with MTA so that you develop your own sense of what you what you can do um you know in particularly east of the tracks uh because west of the tracks i think is is um something that is going to have to be um just looked at in terms of park space uh the current you know boat yards that are there um so it's it's whether you um build anything along the mta tracks on the east side of them a berm that type of thing uh, whether you want to take, how, how seriously, in other words, do we want to take um, the rising sea level or water level, I should say? Tough one. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the next one here, this was uh, uh, one of the, one of the uh, recommendations, issues and opportunities in, uh, in the 09 plan as well, preserving views of the Hudson River and the Palisades. This is an interesting one to us because, um, you know, even even the photo here, we're we're up the hill quite a bit from, uh, from from the river itself, and it it requires some uh, some consideration of of trade offs uh, as we talked about a little bit before, and balance. Um, you want to think about um, which 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 public views are most important that you want to protect, um, and how you can protect them in a way that still allows for development that you want. Um, doesn't have to allow for unchecked development, but the development that the village wants that you, that, that you think that you need, where there's consensus around um, uh, broadening the tax base and, and attracting more, more investment. Um, um, it's, it's an area where you want to you wanna try to find that, uh, try to find that balance. Yeah, I think this is kind of a critical point. Um, and I, I'd really like to hear from some of the comprehensive plan members about this, but you know, one of the one of the facts of, of economics is that if, if you're really close to a train station, uh, if you have, you know, views of the waterfront, then that view uh, is more valuable. That short distance to the train station is more valuable. So whether you put a, a two story building or a five story building or, or a 30 story building, right, the, the more people that get the opportunity to pay for that short walk or that nice view, um, the more people are going to do it. And that adds value to the property, that adds va uh, value that eventually gets borne out in taxes, right? And so um, similarly, when you make decisions as a municipality to say, hey, we want to have, you know, lots that are uh, half an acre and we want one house on each one of these lots and we want 
you know, huge neighborhoods with lots of empty space that require long streets to get to them or long pipes to get to them because that's the nature of how we want our houses. That may improve the value of those individual houses, but it again comes at an additional cost uh, in terms of tax revenue that's not gained if you put more houses on smaller land, right? And so those are the trade-offs that I think that, you know, that you deal with when you're putting together a comprehensive plan. Figuring out which trade-offs you're willing to make if, if you're, if you're going to say, look, we want to maximize our ability to gain as much in tax revenue in these key spaces while preserving, you know, certain things in other areas, right? So, you know, it, think about it like this. If you have a historic district and everything is two stories, right? And if you were allowed to tear it all down, you could put eight story and 10 story buildings there, you would get 10 stories of tax revenue. Is it worth it to you to keep the, the character of that two story building more than getting the tax revenue of those eight story buildings? And, and this is a real decision that ultimately you are making. There's no way of avoiding one decision or another. There's not even necessarily a right answer. It's just about making that trade-off and understanding that that's the trade-off that you make at the end of the day. And if your priorities are, are clear, then it becomes you know, a little easier to make those trade-offs. And, and sometimes you can, you, know, you can put together a plan that's gonna preserve certain areas. It's gonna allow development in other areas. Um, and that, that's how you ultimately get to the final sort of decision that, that lets you say, look, this is how we're gonna meet all of our goals, right? You can, you can meet every goal, but you can't meet every goal every single time, right? Um, you, have to, you have to make those trade-offs. I hope that was clear. I'm not sure if I was confusing, but. Yep. Well, <clears throat> that's why I have suggested that we would look at tax mapping um, analysis or tax revenue analysis to see where the accents in this plan have to be made. Um, uh, the tax mapping that Urban 3 is doing, for example. Frank, could you add to that just a little bit on the tax mapping? I can send you a link about it. Uh, oh, I've that'd got, be great. Yes, I'll, I'll email it to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can try to kind of detail it a little bit for this group, and then we can get um, that email out to the rest of the group, I, if we haven't already sent it out. But essentially, you know, it's, it's, if you were to take the, the every single property, right, every single property gets a tax bill, and you take that tax bill, um, and you lay it over, so you divide it over by the amount of land, right? So you have in, in uh, Austin, you have the value of the land and you have the value of any of the improvements on the land, whether that's a, you know, a, a little uh, parking lot or whether that's, you know, a five story building or an eight story building, right? And so if that one, you know, building that has 2000 square feet in it um, sits on an acre lot, then, then that, total value is going to be, you know, whatever it is. But if that same 2,000 square foot building is on a, you know, an eighth of an acre lot um, or, you know, an eighth of an acre lot has a 5,000 square foot building, it's going to be worth significantly more even though it's on a smaller uh, lot. And so some of the, the, the analysis that Urban 3 is doing, amongst others, is determining which lots are the most valuable, right? And so what they showed in other areas uh, is kind of surprising, right? You, you don't realize it, but the ones that are most efficient in terms of generating tax revenue by, by acreage are really the ones with the highest value um, per acre, right? And that's always gonna be um, in some of the older districts in town because those districts tend to be, you know, more densely built upon. Um, it's gonna be in the main streets and things like that. And, and sometimes the, the, the confusion that comes in is that people think that the actual value is, is found in places like Walmart or, you know, where you have big box stores, but those big box stores tend to be not worth very much um, when, when they're built, right? So the, the land, the, the building value is very low and the land that they sit on is very big. So they don't generate as much tax revenue as say a small building on a small lot in, in Main Street, right? Um, they're not as efficient. Even if they have a total number that's, you know, a little higher, um, it tends not to be as high. And once you get into sort of like tax breaks and things like that, it, it, it sort of changes even further from that. And um, the Urban 3 stuff goes in deeper and starts figuring out things like, you know, how far are you from the water plant? How much 
you know, road infrastructure is required to get to your building, things like that. And so it, it, it builds upon these sort of like uh, inefficiencies of building away from um, train stations or, or main streets or, or sort of um, central business districts. And things. But we, we can uh, send that out to everybody. Yeah, that's a good idea, honey. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and, and, and last one here uh, is about connections to the waterfront. This is this is so important. It, it it's, it's actually why I raised the question before about um, whether visitors um, uh, visit any other parts of, of the village. It's not easy to get from the waterfront uh, to uh, to the other areas, um, or vice versa. And these are issues that are also going to come up in the transportation section. But they're so important to the waterfront that um, that we think it's important to bring them up here uh, here as well. Um, there is uh, the the probably the the most critical one, um, the one that people um, interact with the most is um, is is that drop off area at the train station. Such a um, such a challenging thing to fix, but um, but a, but definitely an issue that we need to start uh, to, uh, to to dig into. Um, I think that the village has done a, a good bit of, of sidewalk improvements between downtown and the waterfront, but maybe there are other um, other improvements that can be made for pedestrians, for cyclists, and uh, and for transit. One of the ideas that we've heard already, we hear really in every every place that we that we work up and up and down the Hudson River, is we need a trolley that connects the downtown with the train station and the waterfront. Um, it's a great idea everywhere. It's a hard thing to pull off everywhere. Um, but it's something that that um, that we can start seed uh, seeding some ideas about how uh, how that might work. Um, Sylvia talked about the Riverwalk before. Um, that's something to to continue to uh, just put into place uh, over time. Um, but also, um, wayfinding is a way to um, direct people from uh, where they're going to arrive to where they want to go. Um, so that someone someone who's arriving at the train station from from the city or further up the river, um, knows how to get to other parts uh, of the village, knows how to get to, um, to the museum, uh, to the greenway, uh, and so on. And so wayfinding is, uh, is, a, is a straightforward way of doing that. So, so these, all these different types of connections and ways that we can improve, uh, improve the connections is something that we're gonna think about as well. Um, that's our last, our last sort of slide on issues and opportunities. Before we move on, we wanted to um, uh, um, take a pause here um, and make sure we're not missing anything. Um, we were able to lean on the 09 plan. Um, there were some good ideas in there. We added some new ideas based on what we've learned so far. Um, but is there anything else, anything glaring that, that you all think we need, to, um, we need to add in here? If, if not. You know, can I, I don't know. Simon, do you wanna, can you go to a, a panel view? Um, too, because I think it's easier to have a dialogue when you can see everybody too. Sure, sure, I'll yes. stop sharing. So, uh, second, there we go. And Jeff, I think you were about to. Yeah, I don't know, um, because you touched on Crawl Bucky Park a little bit, and um, there, there is a planned uh, trail that Crawl Bucky to Snowden. And um, completing that would require uh, cooperation of some undeveloped properties. Um, so I think that like that should be at least acknowledged uh, in ongoing plans. And the other, um, the other aspect of the Hidden Cove project was to create, um, it, it's a sidewalk that would run from well, what would be the new North Water Street um, going from like the bottom of Snowden all the way back to where the, the, that project was developed uh, or not developed, will, will be developed um, if, it, if they get all their permits or whatever they're working on. Um, but there, there are some other issues about access to Crawbucky um, from the end of that road. And there's, I think some uh, just some uncertainty about where the public has a right to enter Crawbucky from the the top of what will become uh, the new mapped part of North Water Street. Um, but I think that those are, uh, there's some uncertainty there and there's like some things that are going to be uh, coming down the road. But I think that we should think
think about them in terms of, um, you know, uh, walkways and paths and how they connect with our existing trails and kind of keep that all in mind as part of the plan. Um, Jeff, are there plans for sort of drawings or even diagrams of that, of, of those trails, those connections to Crawbucky? I know that um, our planner, maybe two planners ago, or one planner ago uh, had them. I know that there's, there are paper uh, maps of that. And the Hidden Cove project, the developer was required as part of the site plan to, it's like a little more than an acre. They're gonna create a conservation easement there and extend the Crawbucky Trail. So right now it sort of ends, um, it ends in, in basically the, the, the dairy, uh, the back of the dairy there, uh, or the dairy building. Um, and so what they're gonna do is create a loop that'll go back up behind the Hidden Cove project in, in the woods back there. It's like about an eight, um, if Stewart's on the call, he might remember more of the details. But then there's a property on Snowden that has come before the planning board various times informally and um, I don't, it, it seems to have never, it's obviously never gotten off the ground, but um, that property I believe is the final piece uh, to link the, to, to connect that trail over to Snowden. Um, so I, I actually don't know all the, de I'm trying to think of which planner it was, but um, I know that, with, that the planning department does have those maps and that's something just ask that we make sure that like those goals were updating going forward in this comprehensive plan as well. Yeah, yeah I think anything that's, uh, anything that's been, find those. Yeah, anything that's been, um, you know, included on, on site plans, I think we want to reflect that for sure. And then the other pieces that are more perspective, I think we can show those, um, you know, you know, sort of intended future extension that sort of thing. Uh, I do you think you can get those uh, those past plans? Yeah, I can certainly um, go try to see if I can get a look at that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll, um, I have, yeah, yes. We could then show there them. Might, um, Keller Sessions might have them because I'm pretty sure when we were like at the very end of the site plan approval for Hidden Cove, that Keller Sessions and the planner at the time uh, did went back and walked the area of that trail because we we need to know whether it was feasible to actually extend the Crawbucky Trail into this conservation easement. So I'm pretty sure Keller Sessions has seen them. So if that helps you find them, um, ask them. Do you know if it was the, just out of curiosity? Do you know if that was near the OCA or is it like straight out onto Snowden Avenue from uh, that site? Where the conservation easement was, or yeah. Um, so if you're uh, looking at where the old uh, Brandreth office building was, if you're standing facing directly, you're facing east. Um, and then there's like the cleared area there. Uh, the land starts to slope up a little bit and it's in those woods there is where the, um, the conservation easement is. And so the, the plan that's, it, I know it's on the drawings, the, the, this new trail um, went, it, it actually was a loop within the conservation easement, the trail, and then it went north and then it snaked uh, west and connected with the current Crawbucky Trail. And then there was also language in the site plan resolution that they had to cooperate once we got the next piece um, and that's the piece closer to Snowden so, um, so that we could ultimately complete the trail all the way through over to Snowden. And there, may, there actually may be two more pieces beyond that to, to fully complete the trail but um, this was part of that, uh, bringing it all the way over. So Jeff, Joe Cermelli, he was probably, was he at Keller Session at the time? Was he? Yeah, I think he, I think so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so Joe's been, 
questions. Yeah. So I mean, we could. He yeah, probably I'll, I'll, I'll definitely send him an email, and I, I know you yeah. guys will reach out as well. So. Yep. Yeah, guys, okay. guys I, I, there is a uh, sketch drawing of uh, the proposed conservation easement <laughs> extension and the trail, I believe, in the FEIS for Hidden Cove. It's on the, uh, it's on the village's website. I, I, you can download it there. Are you, can, do you have it on your screen? Can you share I, it? Jonathan, you just, uh, we just lost your audio. No, that's okay. Sorry. Yeah, do I have uh, sharing capabilities? You do. Wow, great. Okay. I don't know if you can see that. that that's what I found. Yeah, so it's not oriented north south here, but. Um, I don't see if I could draw like north is uh, this way. But um, so the current Crawl Bucky Trail kind of ends like here. And there's okay. a little there's a little like piece that hangs that just juts off. And so the the trail what what they were to do with this conservation easement was connect the trail over here and make a loop and then ultimately to go over to Snowden um there would have to be cooperation from these properties at the bottom of the screen here so oh, i see and you can i don't know how to yeah, delete it looks like oh. jeff right yeah it looks like jeff right now they uh, on their drawing they showed this only this part of the loop see that line that dashed okay. line so, so that was their loop with maybe the idea in the future, once the agreements were set with uh, the adjacent property owners to provide access to Snowden, that's when it would it would connect. Okay, um, but I guess my point being that um, they are required to cooperate once the next part of the trail is, uh, you know, developed. And um, yeah, I think that we should just make sure that that's. Uh, part of the plan, you know, that we acknowledge okay. that the plans going forward. Okay. And I don't know. I don't yeah, know definitely. To, I mean, I don't it's know a great to, opportunity. Yeah. I don't know how to get this off the screen when I just drew there. So maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. again. <laughs> well, maybe we'll, um, Jeff, thanks. Sharon. We'll, we'll, we'll touch base with Joseph and I'm sure. Oh yeah, actually, email. there's one other thing I want to oh, mention. Sorry. Oh, I don't know if you can put it back really quick. There's just one other issue that I was, um, I wanted to mention. So as part of the project, and this view doesn't really show it, but I'll just draw again since that worked. I'll do a different color. Um, the North Water Street, which is not a mapped street, as part of the project, North Water Street would extend down to here and become a mapped street. And the in between the Diamond Dairy and the other building that are there, there's like what a you know, um, I guess it would be like right here on the map. It seems like there's a natural entrance to the park right there. Mm -hmm. And I know that there were a number of people who came to speak in front of the planning board saying that their understanding was that there was an easement or some public right of way to enter the park mm -hmm. from there. But um, once, if the Hidden Cove project is built and we get North Water Street, uh, yeah, it's, it's like sort of between these two buildings. And if you come down the Crawl Bucket Trail, you could see, um, you could see right there, uh, the trail just kind of empties into the parking lot. Um, but once, once the North Water Street is, uh, if, it, if this comes to fruition and it becomes a real road, um, the idea would be the public could come straight from the waterfront along the waterfront um, right up to this. And, and if that is a real true connection to the park, then this becomes a connection from the waterfront to Crawl Bucky. And then once this trail, which is the trail we've already mapped is an, is like a separate. Now I'm drawing all over the screen, but that's a separate connection from Snowden to Crawl Bucky. And so you start to get like all these trails um, and, and creating, different ways for people on foot to access um, 
the park and um, just creating like beautiful places for people to traverse the village. Nice. Okay. So, but I don't know. There was always a dispute and never as to whether right here the the there the public has a, a legal way to enter the park. So you can take it down. That was my yeah, other. Maybe Jeff, that we get and describe this generally in the plan, but at this level of detail, we might say that you know that that that's going to come before you again eventually, the planning board, I guess. So we ought to show it maybe generally when Jaime gets gets the actual maps maybe from Joe Cermelli. Right. Yeah. Okay. But All right. Great. I I just think that uh, it's a if if this project um, is built um, and I think that there's a number of other properties there that have uh, potential um, for development. Um, it's an extension of the waterfront as we sort of know it now. And as we like envisioned earlier on some of the, um, some of, some of the graphics you showed earlier in the presentation. Right. Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Good. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Anything else on these these sort of preliminary ideas on the waterfront that um, we missed, or, or or any comments on on what we talked about? Okay. Great. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring my screen back up, and and we'll go through the rest of the the presentation. But as we did last month, um, our sort of next steps here are um, to pull this chapter together. Um, we'll send it to you um, in advance of the next meeting, so that we can have a um, have a follow up discussion and, and, and get additional comments from, from all of you. Great. Um, so um, just a few um, last updates here. The first one is um, we wanted to let you know where we are in the subcommittee meetings. Um, we've had we've had three of them. We've got a fourth tomorrow. Uh, we've been trying to set up, um, you know, about two per week starting last week. Um, and uh, these have been very helpful so far. Um, they're they're going to uh, sort of contribute to uh, our thinking about about each of the chapters as we uh, as we go forward. Um, we've been scheduling them, scheduling them, you know, essentially as we've got a full, a uh, full group. So a couple of them um, uh, that that filled in uh, sort of earlier were the community services and cultural and historic organizations. We had some nice conversations last week. Um, we we had uh, the subcommittee meeting on infrastructure and, and municipal services earlier today, and then housing is tomorrow. Um, and and so as we've talked about before, we're going to. Um, share um, drafts with with these groups um, as we as we produce them so that we get their feedback um, along the way. It's been very helpful so far. Um, you know, I'd like to jump in real fast and just make a, a quick mention uh, to the uh, to the steering committee tonight. Um, I know that we've gotten a lot of robust conversation in some of the other steering committee meetings, and today uh, it looks like everybody's kind of soaking in what they're hearing and. Not providing as much comment, but I, I do want to kind of remind you um, all of your role of really helping to shape and guide this process, right? So the you know BFJ, um, even though you you know Frank Fish is, is very familiar with the area, uh, BFJ is an outside consultant. They're sort of you know doing their best to to get uh, as knowledgeable as they can about the place. Um, I'm pretty new, so you know I'm giving them all the guidance I can, but it's limited in terms of my experience. Um, and the reason we have a steering committee made up of, of such a diverse set of um, voices from within the community is because it's really important that you help guide uh, the consultants through this process to make sure that they're capturing everything that they need to do. So I'm not, you know, necessarily saying that anybody has to sort of like jump in now and start providing comments, but it is really important to take that role of, 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 of being a, a steering committee in, in steering the, the comprehensive plan uh, to the place that you want it to be at. Um, and so just keep that in mind as, as we go through this process over the next, um, you know, several months. You know, I, I mean, I'm just going to add really quickly too that um, this is uh, tomorrow night, the uh, Board of Trustees will be voting on a resolution um, uh, whether to provide uh, Wilder Balter 
associates with a preferred developer status, which would in, uh, allow a six month uh, public review of the DPW site and based on a concept of a mixed income, mixed use uh, um, project there um, that could, you know, that, that would uh, ideally include remediation of what's now a very toxic brownfield, um, an extend, extended uh, extension of the Sing Sing Hill walkway and other things. So that, that actually touches on all of these points. Um, some of the feedback we're getting on that is concerns about, uh, concerns about sea level rise and, and sustainability of something there. Um, concerns about, obviously, whenever we talk about any kind of housing, we're talking about impact on the school district. Uh, but we also need, we also are hearing about the needs for housing, um, you know, the needs for, for density and, and um, you know, we have a lot of different things. When, when uh, Paul and I, our, our village engineer, were down at the waterfront recently, right now that we have the DPW site, which is essentially our village you know, we use it for organic waste. I, I don't know how else to say this, but it's really a dump and, and literally, and we have another site that's down by North Water Street that is also used for um, uh, construction materials and, and organic waste. And um, some of the people who live down there um, uh, in Varium in the condos, that, that very old historic building that's condos were complaining. Um, we we also have a lot of um, industrial sites down there too. So while there might not seem like there's a lot to develop there, like there's just a lot of established things, there's actually quite a bit of potential. What happens there matters, but I think everybody feels like something needs to happen. We're very, very conflicted as a community of what that means and what that looks like. So again, to, to say what Jaime's saying, there will be not only opportunity for this project, but if the DPW project, um, if Wilder Bolter is, is approved as the preferred developer, there'll be opportunity to, for the community uh, and for you all to shape that project as well. Um, but we, the, the waterfront, our waterfront is very, very much uh, an area in transition and what happens to it will largely dictate what happens in the rest of Austin as well. So it's an important, probably one of the most important chapters. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that just to give everyone here some context, um, you know, the, the sort of flip side of, of a small municipality is a place like uh, the country of Monaco, right? The country of Monaco is about three quarters of a mile, right? And it's super rich and super wealthy. We're not going to turn into Monaco tomorrow, but uh, there's a lot that you can do and a lot of value you can create in, in a small area. We have, um, you know, significantly larger space than that. Uh, and so we, we have a lot of, you know, a lot to build on if we choose to, and we have a lot to preserve uh, if we choose to, so. I'll jump in. I appreciate Jaime the nudge on participation from the steering committee and uh, also from you, Karen, on the uh, larger context with um, building in that area and, and, and what it means to do stuff uh, here in general. So I'll speak for myself. I, because I don't want to speak for anybody else. I, I, don't have, I don't have the ability to do that. But with this conversation specifically, I think one of the things that is difficult is that the, the, the question, so I'll, I'll, I'll start very simply. So it's, it seems to me very easy to sound very dumb it, with this conversation because when you ask a question for example like what can we do down at the waterfront like everything seems kind of developed i'm like why don't you build like you know like the um the uh, the high line let's build like a big high line on the water that goes like above the train and it's like you can't do that it's too expensive it's impossible blah, 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 blah. so it's like okay so what are we doing I, you know so it feels like is this, I, I, I'm not gonna like, let's not go to like blue sky, imagine like what's possible. I, I, so, and nor should we say like do nothing. So there's something between nothing and then like in my dream world with unlimited money. And that is where I think somebody like Jeff brings in like very detailed with, with the maps and the drawing and all that. And, and that's amazing and, and that's really good. For somebody like me, where I could be most valuable is with a little bit more targeted of a question of like 
if we were to do X, who would benefit? Who would lose? Who would, who would be opposed? Those are things that I can provide context with and maybe like a path forward for different things. But it's very hard for me to say like, let's connect this trail and do this. Because honestly, it's one of the most frustrating things. I, I go to a place like um, I, a Peekskill and you can walk from the, uh, the, the from the waterfront like all through and all around and it's like well i'm like why don't we have this in austin it's amazing you know just walking down the waterfront piers and it's like it's like a jigsaw puzzle of like a thousand different things put together they i'm sure it was a mess to put together but you you can walk from one place to another and you're on the waterfront i'm like we need this I'm like well we have a prison and we have this and so I'm looking for a path forward and I'm just looking for a path to be most helpful while also not seeming real dumb, which is my hesitation to contribute to this conversation in a meaningful way. So, you know, it, it, so this comes up a lot and, and it, it's a hard thing to do because you're saying, what, what can you do? And this was a little bit of the challenge of the Cornell study because we actually asked uh, students to say what would you do and they did a lot of really fabulous stuff uh, none of which we have any money for whatsoever however um the the one of the things that and this is a bit of the challenge some of the development is going to be dependent on getting private sector entities involved some of it could be grant money some of it could be um actually those are probably the two primary ways the village itself has no real funding to do something um to really do very much down there other than what we basically do of maintaining the properties. And um, so uh, the village's ability to build anything or do anything as a village is almost non-existent, which it makes it a challenge when we wanna move, like if we planned it today, we probably wouldn't put our lay down yards at, in, on the waterfront. I'm just sure that we wouldn't, but now that they're there, how do we get them off? And then how do we deal with when we say we're gonna move them Somebody says, well, you know, I don't want any more people down here. There's already too many people. But so that's a, that I think really speaks to getting to that. And we had had this conversation earlier and um, had actually talked about the peak skill example. If we want to see more activity down at the riverfront, there's likely to be more private sector uh, influences, be they business or residential or both. And I think those are some of the challenges. Um, I, I don't want to talk too much because I really do want to hear from everybody else. But part of the thing is, and let without those those catalysts, there's you know, or people willing to invest, it's very hard for us to do much more than maintain what we already have. Yeah, I, you know, I'm gonna so I'm gonna attempt to throw out something that may make some sense to respond back to, right? Uh, at the waterfront right now, you have uh, somewhat of a pull from a train station there. You have access to the water. There's canoeing on the waterfront. There is some small resident, uh, small you know, restaurant opportunities over there. But the waterfront, because of its proximity to the train station, uh, because of the fact that you do have nice views um, throughout the year, um, provides an excellent opportunity for any building that can, that can take advantage of those view sheds. Um, for an investment standpoint uh, for private entities. And you have a lot of buildings over there that are currently two and three stories. From a development standpoint, if, if somebody says I have a, a building that's two stories or three stories and I go and try to sell my property to a developer and, and tell them, hey, you can build four stories here on top of this existing two story building, you will not drive development in any sort of meaningful way over time, right? And I think that the lack of investment that you've seen in the downtown, in, in the waterfront area, um, is largely because it's very difficult to, to make the financing work from that standpoint. So you have to sort of make a decision as to whether or not you are willing to be somewhat transformative in the amount of density that you would allow in at least a small area to go higher, to grant people the opportunity to take chance of those view sheds of the beautiful views of the water. And if the desire is to preserve the small character of the waterfront, then that's something that could be expressed in the comprehensive plan. If the desire is to create more buildable space, even albeit in a small defined area right around the waterfront, that can take advantage of the view shed that exists leading up to Main Street, then that is also something that you could do potentially by adding a higher density 
you know, within a, you know, walking distance of the train station that allows you to go up to eight, 10, you know, 12 stories um, without any real significant challenges. That is a decision I think that is in front of the, the village right now. They can say, do we want to build high density, maximize the, the development opportunities in this small area, which can in turn help build more, you know, foot traffic to the, to the restaurants that we have on Main Street, could, you know, bring, bring in more tax dollars uh, to the school district potentially that could have a significant economic development impact or are we more interested in keeping the small character of the waterfront right uh, you have a lot of stuff there including some public parking lots that even though they're being used as parking lots now right now are still fundamentally assets that could theoretically be turned into you know parking garages and more development structures now again i don't know that i'm not recommending that anybody do any of these things, but these are actual options that could be considered as a part of this plan if the steering committee thought that we should consider them. If they're non-starters for everybody in the steering committee, then there are also things that we could sort of direct our attention away from. You know, I think that one of the things that would help the community have the conversation is if we can visually show um, the renderings, or drawings, what the different types of scaling you just talked about look like. And then if we can um, quantify the tax benefit or uh, detriment or however people wanna look at it and the other impacts of uh, sort of going with different options along that scale. Um, because I think that Sometimes when the, you know, any, the potential development of any site comes up, uh, there, like a, there's a, a few arguments that everything gets reduced to. Um, you know, very frequently we'll end up talking about impacts on the school and none of the other potential impacts or uh, on the school district or um, the other potential benefits that a, that a project might bring. So I think that um, if we're gonna have that discussion, I think that like visually we have to see what that looks like because I think that that's an important part of, um, uh, you know, visualizing what it, literally what it would sort of be built out like, but also lay out the different impacts on that scale um, to help the community have that conversation. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, this is Pat. I think the, that that's, that would be helpful as well, but, you know, maybe a way to get at that would be through comparables, right? I, yeah. you know, th that would be, a, that would be a little less onerous in terms of specificity, right? Just in terms of, but, yeah, you know, spent more specificity is good, but yeah, you know, I just I know there's a trade off between time and uh, yeah, yeah, like sort of case studies. We can look exactly. at other communities, yeah. right? You know, I so you, know, you mentioned mentioned Monaco, right? That that's you know one one extreme. You've got peak skill. You've got which has a little bit more. I mean, my perception is that it has more developable land that they were able to use, right? But you know, in the conversation we just had, I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe my preconceived notion of how much there is, how much opportunity there is down there is, is a little, skewed, right? So I need to kind of think through that myself, but, or, you know, something mid, mid density, something high density, you know, there's the Yonkers to me is a high density, you know, big buildings right on the water all along, right? With, and so I think there's a, a medium, there are a couple of yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really, that's a key point, right? There, and there are, you know, Yonkers is funny, right? Yonkers, the highest building in downtown Yonkers is 23 stories. Um, the, the biggest, densest uh, municipality, at least in terms of redevelopment plans, is actually New Rochelle, right? New Rochelle's coming in with all the big buildings. They've decided to go all in on density around their train station. Um, Yonkers has decided that they don't really want that. So most of their buildings are, you know, under... 10 stories. Uh, there are a few newer buildings that are coming in that are taller than that, but they're not super high. Um, and, and, you know, again, so every, when you talk about measures of efficiency, 
the more stuff you put on a single site, uh, the more valuable the property is, the more tax it'll generate. Um, you know, if it's on a single small site, right? And the less you put on that site, right? So if you say, for instance, you have a, a parking lot, right? A parking lot's not worth much, right? You put a house up there and then suddenly it's worth more. If you put a two-story house, it's worth more than that, right? If you put a, you know, a multifamily building on that same lot, it's worth more and it keeps going up and up and down. And so there's a breaking point where certainly I think the constituents are going to say, no, this is absolutely unacceptable. This is not what we want. Right. And trying to figure out um, where that is uh, would be helpful. I know uh, Tina Lund from Urbanomics is going to be doing a uh, sort of an analysis of like what what the difference between a five story and an eight story and a ten story building or something like that. Well, is. Right right now, Jaime, what she's doing is a um, a prototype um, a building, which would, is 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 simply a five story prototype because it takes time to set it up a little bit. So it's a downtown site. Uh, Four, four stories with a bonusable fifth floor, 10% uh, affordable and a market rate building. So we're starting there. But one thing I'd like to pick up on, if I may, I think because we're working in some of these comparable waterfront communities, we could give you some different scales. For instance, the Pink Scale scale versus a Tarrytown waterfront scale, a Yonkers waterfront scale. Um, a uh, New Rochelle is different because their waterfront, their waterfront is uh, um, different than downtown. But um, we could do that. That would be some visuals for you. Okay. I mean, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's not Simon. So everything that I've been hearing is about residential, sure. And uh, one of the things that I get a lot of complaints is, um, you know, how's my taxes going to go? Or, you know, why my taxes keep going up? And how's the school going? You know, the overcrowding on the school system. So one of the things that you guys mentioned early in the conversation was Beacon and what Beacon did. So, um, you know, I went, I was there online just a few minutes ago to see what they did in 2017 on their master plan. And they changed something. You know, they changed one section and they actually two sections. They added a light industrial section and they did a water um, waterfront development where there is allow, they can allow residential by a special permit. So everything that I'm hearing so far um, is about residential, but we haven't talked that you guys haven't bring anything up to the light industrial. I'm not even talking about office spaces because office spaces after this pandemic, I don't even know what that means anymore. Uh, but you know, the model of cities I, me personally, I would try to stay away from that because we are not a city. We are the village of Austin. We are a small community on that one. Um, so, you know, if we're going to start seeing models on this, I would like to see models with what we look like, not with, you know, what the, you know, what Yonkers did or what New Rochelle did. You know, there's some mm -hmm. concepts in those cities that I would love to kind of see but you know, I don't want to compare myself to that because we're not a city. Um, in regards to that, um, to the connection that uh, Omar was referring before, uh, and I don't remember what year it was that one, but I know Westchester County was working in the Riverwalk and different connections from different municipalities and how they wanted to connect 51.5 miles on the Hudson River. And we were one of them. So all these connections that we've been working on it uh, for the past couple of years now uh, are towards to get to that goal. I, I know Tarrytown and what the development Tarrytown is doing over there with the old GM plant and what they're doing, they, they extend in the, that walkability pad as well. So at some point in time, we have to look into that as well. And there is a map on the Westchester County's website where that actually shows you know, what that path looks like. Uh, so when Hidden Cove was in part in, you know, early in the development of the site plan, that was one of the requirements that they needed to kind of make that connection to, to what the pad looks like. So again, mm -hmm. and, and I guess sort of my last question on, on my end, Elise, is that you guys talked about, you know, that you guys have so far two meetings and just for the public uh, to be aware you know, who was the community service uh, group that you guys met and about the culture and history organizations that you guys met and who is, 
who is that you guys are meeting tomorrow for housing? Because I think that's going to be uh, some questions that I'm going to get from, from, from community members and be like, who are they meeting? And is those meetings at some point of time, uh, you know, what is the feedback that they're getting? Oh, oh, Absolutely, Manny. I that? think that um, uh, Karen might be best because she she uh, uh, got, uh, you know, invited the people to be on the subcommittee. We've got a list of all of those, so we can certainly, um, you know, make all of that available, and we're doing meeting records. Mm -hmm. The subcommittee was shared with this committee, the subcommittee list of all everybody where we were inviting, and the subcommittee list was shared with the mayor, um, we also, I, I have to pull it together of who actually responded. I think we have about 20 people. It involves uh, um, uh, developers. It involves uh, various different people in the housing community. Um, so there's a pretty wide swath of, of people from various different perspectives. Uh, most of them are involved in, in um, the housing arena in one way, shape, or form. Um, we also have other committees that will inform, you know, every subcommittee informs the other subcommittee, so they all overlap. Like the school subcommittee will talk about the school district needs, economic development, we'll talk about economic development. But I think you raised a really important point, and, and actually this is a conversation we had earlier today. So what does, um, what does, uh, what does it take to develop a light industrial zone or whatever what does it take to attract these things because that's so what we're walking is the challenge so when you have cities and some of these are small cities um none of them are villages because it's the city of beacon the city of Peekskill, the city of you know um when we talk about um villages then you really tend to become it's it's a bit more about density sometimes there's a big rateable there sometimes there's there's a, a you know a big development but so you know, when we look at what we're saying, um, we may be a village, but in a lot of ways, we replicate the smaller cities um, in terms of, of our current infrastructure and housing and, and business stock and uh, uh, socioeconomic demographics. So, you know, we're, we're sort of our own, um, our own patients. We have an opportunity to borrow a lot from other, other areas, regardless of what their um, designation is. And that is something, and Frank, you um, and Simon talked a bit about Peekskill in particular, and, and the fact that Peekskill is a city, but not in the same way that New Rochelle or Yonkers is in terms of oh, size, no, or Gallup, right. yeah, more analogous. So, yeah, and and so how they were able to do their waterfront and, and get to where, you know, they have some momentum now. Um, and I think that's that's probably one of the most relevant examples, but maybe you can speak a little bit to how they're doing development beyond just uh, housing. Yeah, well, historically, and, and also I'll just point out that there are some villages we can uh, turn to as comps, and that's Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow are both villages. Yeah. You know, Dobbs Ferry across the river in Nyack. Um, uh, yeah. So we, we can give comps from those as, as well, but I think the key in all of them has been that there was not, there's, there's some, well, I should clarify that sometimes there is a, uh, you know, a, a, a large catalyst. Um, but in other times, uh, I think um, uh, on some of these where we've worked, um, Pink Skill grew over time. It started with some, uh, by grew, I mean, uh, the, the uh, catalyst for developing the waterfront took a while. And it goes all the way back 20, at least 20 years when they were getting grants for their water mm -hmm. park system and trail system. But as we got involved in the LWRP, a lot of the zoning uh, predated the current work that they're doing now. Um, so it took some time uh, to do, um, but they interrelated their downtown things that were happening, their waterfront things, uh, they looked at housing as well as retail, commercial uh, development, restaurants, bars, breweries, um, but they also maintained some industrial. So I would say it's a mixed use um, development that has happened in Peekskill that has set a good stage for, you know, for their waterfront now. The basis of it originally was, you know, at one time a man named Pataki was mayor. He became governor. He gave them a lot of, you know, they got quite a bit of grant money. Um, and now, of course, they have a DRI, uh, which is worth 10 million or so. So, um, but can I each of those 
each of those over historically, Tarrytown, if it had a catalytic project though, it was uh, in terms of the waterfront, it was Joe Cotter. It was, you know, a developer willing to build. In his case, he was building four or five story uh, stuff, very successful. And it created a catalytic uh, approach there. And now you have a very successful, I think, um, uh, image uh, to Terrytown. I think you're gonna have the same thing in Sleepy Hollow with, you had a catalytic project uh, that's been approved, is now getting underway on the waterfront, the edge, uh, you know, at Sleepy Hollow. So, but I do think it's interrelated um, uh, issues and, and multiple use that, for instance, Peekskill was looking at, and I think it's uh, becoming a success in Peekskill. So if, if I could um, follow up on a point that Manny made and, and maybe tie this back to the, uh, to the question that Omar raised uh, um, at the beginning of this discussion. I don't think that comps are about, um, Manny, to your point, how tall are the residential buildings? It's about what is making these, these waterfront areas attractive and what can Austin learn from that in order to, uh, to create a vision for this waterfront neighborhood that's up on the screen here. Um, and, and so to Manny, to your question, what I would put back to you and put to the committee is, you know, we can't develop a vision for you for, for this area. Um, here's what BFJ thinks this area should become. What do you think this area should become? What will, what will make you come down to the waterfront more often? What, is, what do you think is gonna make people come up from the city um, or, or a transient boater dock in the waterfront and then walk into the neighborhood and, or maybe walk up the hill into the downtown? Those are, those are the kinds of questions that aren't about, um, you, know, um, you know, Omar, your, your point about the, the, you know, the, the sort of offsetting high line, it's more, it's more fundamental than that. Um, what is going to make this neighborhood um, uh, the, the future that you all want it to become uh, and, and also attract residents, attract businesses, light industrial or maybe office or whatever you think the, the future of this neighborhood ought to be. Um, that's the kind of, that, that's what we're trying to get at. Um, on the slide here, um, you know, what, what we, the, the sort of big picture concept that we thought um, this might be a starting point for this waterfront neighborhood is, um, could we make it more cohesive? Could we make it a place where um, it's a complete neighborhood for someone? Um, someone could live here um, and shop and dine uh, and commute if they're commuting. And if, if the neighborhood's providing those sorts of, uh, those sorts of assets, those so sorts of benefits for, for residents, those are assets for someone who wants to visit as well, right? Someone who's coming on a boat or on the train, they're gonna wanna go to the restaurant or the bar, right? And then they might see the sign that, oh, the downtown is up the hill. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that we're trying to get at. What is the future of this, of the, of this waterfront neighborhood? Uh, and what is it, and what does it wanna become? What do you want it to become? Is, um, is there intention to establish some type of feedback loop between the subcommittees and the steering committee? Um, I ask that because a lot of um, the nuances that we're trying to discuss here, I think that would be beneficial, especially given the uh, limitations that our particular waterfront have or, or the unique aspects of this community in general. So I think um, my impression of the role of the subcommittees was for a bit more of the nuances to kind of be panned out in that and give the steering committee a bit more um, context for these conversations. So maybe I'm mistaking, maybe that's changed. I'm just curious if there's any intention for some type of feedback loop system between the subcommittees and the steering committee. Uh, uh, Karen, I, I, you're probably best at answering that, but we'd certainly like to do that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're going to have, uh, you know, meeting record of each of these committees, and then there may be an appropriate time. We haven't really talked to the committees yet about, uh, you know, we, uh, as we went over, today's was, uh, you know, community facilities um, type of thing. We've done um, the cultural, uh, historic and cultural. We haven't had anything directly uh, uh, related to the waterfront. So, um, but, but as we do those, we can certainly, uh, uh g give you first a, a meeting record of those. And then Karen, if you want to. Well, I, th I think more importantly than that, Melissa, I think you make an excellent 
point, and I don't know that we've done a good enough job of, of explaining that or, or, or really thinking that through here. I think that um, you're absolutely right. So the idea of the subcommittees is to provide those nuanced views from people who, uh, for whatever reason, because of their profession or, or the, how they're involved, or in some cases even staff, that you have this collective viewpoint that informs based on a, a certain area of, of expertise, if you will, or, or knowledge base. So we have to be using that to repopulate, you know, all of these chapters and, and to, to flesh them out. So I think that what we need to do with the committees is as that, that as we start getting the committees is that that can be part of the reporting back um, to the steering committee. So what I think though, that this is though, that we still have to have a, a broad strokes understanding. So it's sort of that give and take, but I, I, you know, Melissa, I really think your, I, you know, your thoughts about the, the subtleties and the nuances are really, really important. I do think though, that for this committee, talking about some of the bigger issues. So we know that we have a lot of space down in, in at a waterfront that's really used for industrial uses. It's not really, um, you know, there are really, really great areas to walk around the waterfront, but you, the whole waterfront, it's not like a peak seal where you have a continuous uh, park. Um, you, uh, you know, so what do we do? And as, as buildings, um, you know, as we develop, uh, a more cohesive feel to that. What does that look like? And then that gets into the issue of what does that mean in terms of residential density, in terms of uh, other things that we, we might, might want to see that and how do we incent that? Because right now I think our big, biggest challenge is getting that incentivized. So we probably have um, now the biggest market is rent residential, but how do you leverage that to the other things? And then how can we take the information that we have from the environmental perspective, the sea level rise and everything else and meld that into the plan. But if we don't bring this all together and have more substantive and come back to these discussions, um, then I, I think we're gonna miss all those nuances. So I, I think that's an excellent point. Good, good. So we will, to, to that point, we will actually have implement that system to make sure that, that we are doing that and providing those feedback loops. By the way, because it's 9.15 now, could I, I suggest we just show you the final slides and then if we want to talk further, just so you see them. And if we want to talk further, we'll, of course, stay on the call. Okay, so um, the next one was just a, a sort of an update on community engagement. The, the big discussion item here is the public survey. Um, we sent a draft of the questions to all of you on, on Friday. Um, our hope is to go live with this, um, you know, maybe the first week of July. And so we were suggesting um, if you all could send us comments um, uh, by June. Through Karen, through Karen or Jaime. Yeah, yeah through Karen or Jaime. Um, you, know, um, you know, sort of go through that. Um, are there questions that are missing? Hopefully not too many. Um, we think it's about as long as we want it to be. Um, if you, we always run the risk of a survey getting too long, people not finishing it. It's a tough balance. We want to make sure we get all the, uh, get, all, get all the information that we need. Um, is a question not worded quite right? Um, so um, any comments like that, please, um, please let us know so that we can, um, we can, we can, um, we can do the survey next. The survey we think will overlap a bit with the, um, with the ideas wall, which is currently up now. And then the next tool, which will roll out, roll out later in the summer, will be the interactive map. Okay. And then um, last bit here is um, is you know really just a, a reminder on on comments on the survey, uh, comments on the land use and zoning chapter. Again, on the chapters, it's not that we won't listen to your comments later on. I'm sure you'll continue to get, give us comments as we go through the process. Um, we just want to make sure that that um, we can get a draft up uh, on the website for um, for the public to review. Um, we'll have a draft of the waterfront chapter at, at our next meeting next month uh, on July 21st. And at that meeting, we'll we'll present an intro as we did, did tonight on the waterfront of, of the downtown and economic development chapter. 
So I just want to stress that these chapters are drafts. They're still outlines and framework. So we will have a lot of opportunity to make sure that we're, we're fleshing them out. And if we have to have um, more iterative, we, we have to set up a format. I think part of the challenge is we're not doing some of the workshops and things that we'd be doing in a non-COVID time. But if we have to do more iterative discussions, I, I don't. I know it, it's hard for people to schedule, but I also want to make sure that we're we're covering all these things, and we do have a lot of different perspectives. One of the challenges is that that we sort of know what the issues are. Um, I think in in how we get to the next point. The other thing that I want to um, some a, a couple of people who I've been talking to based on subcommittees, based on issues of economic development and economic recovery due to the COVID crisis, have talked about um, establishing some some forums for dialogue to uh, whether it's a, a forum on economic development, whether it's one on um, you know uh, hopefully we'll have the um, summary of the Cornell adaptive study so that we can present that in, in a more right now we have the presentations are online but we don't have like a concise way to present that to people so that they can absorb it we're hoping to have that soon um, but we can also schedule some some forum and panel discussions to to better inform based on uh, case histories of what other people have done too which I think can enrich this experience significantly so um, that's something that that other groups have asked us to participate in as, as just part of overall um, efforts, um, particularly in light of, of wanting to make sure we, we uh, spark economic recovery uh, subsequent to the coronavirus. But those are things that we can also use to inform this process. Um, and if that's something that the steering committee is interested in, we can we can work on that as well. Well, terrific. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. And, and is there are any any uh, other concluding comments or questions from the committee? Uh, then I think maybe we're we're all set for this evening. There, I just want to. Um, uh, hi, May. I'm not sure if you caught it. There is a hand up um, among the attendees. Um, hold on. Let me let me open that up. That's a JB Hernandez. All right. Hi JB, you are uh, able to speak. You had a question. I think he's muted at the moment. I see he's muted. Yeah, I don't know why he's muted. Can you take off the screen share while we're doing Q and A? Yes. Or do you there you go. Yeah, JB has his hand up. I'm not sure why. He, JB knows how to use Zoom very well. He's on all the planning board and zoning board. And in. <laughs> He's a pro. Uh, so he may have just inadvertently pressed it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap up then. If, um, if there's nothing else, um, that was a nice summary by Karen and uh, I think we're we're probably at a wrap up stage now, unless there's anything else, Jaime or. Uh... Yeah, no, I I just wanted to um you know kind of reiterate what Karen mentioned, uh, Melissa, your point is extremely um, well uh, given, and we uh, do need to make sure that uh, the the summaries of those steering committee meetings are provided to this entire board as quickly as possible. So we'll make sure that that gets out. Um, it does help inform the discussion. Uh, is certainly the steering committee is guiding, but we, you know, the subcommittees are probably providing a lot of input that the steering committee needs to hear. And so, um, you know, just kind of like uh, to build upon my point earlier, uh, you know, this is a process that y'all are leading that the, the community uh, is putting together, right? And so it's really important that this, this uh, comprehensive plan is reflective of what the community wants. Uh, so while there are a lot of options, the, the feedback that we get from the subcommittee, from the steering committee and everything else, you know, has to guide this process because ultimately this is something that affects everyone, uh, not just on this uh, Zoom call, but everybody in the entire community. So thank you uh, for all of your input today. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. So uh, I hope everybody's got the July meeting though in their calendar. <laughs> That's the most... Uh,
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank